As the pandemic enters its endemic phase, where COVID-19 is going to be with us forever, exactly like the flu, for example, inflation is rearing its ugly head across most industrialized economies the world over. But is it an ugly head? To answer this question, we should revisit the last period in history where inflation was prevalent and a concern about 10 to 20 years ago. And I would like to start by referring to a series of speeches by the idol of central banking, the head of the Federal Reserve at the time, Alan Greenspan. In a series of, series of speeches designed to defend his record, Alan Greenspan, which until that time had been an icon of both the new economy and stock exchange effervescence, Greenspan reiterated the orthodoxy of central banking everywhere. His job, said Greenspan disingenuously, his job was confined to taming prices and ensuring monetary stability. He could not, and indeed would not, second-guess the market. Greenspan consistently sidestepped the thorny issues of how, or just how, destabilizing to the economy the bursting of asset bubbles is, and how his policies may have contributed to the froth and foam in financial markets. Greenspan and his ilk, other central bankers at the time, appeared to be fighting yesteryear's war against a long slain monster. The obsession with price stability led to policy excesses and disinflation gave way to deflation, arguably an economic ill far more pernicious than inflation. Deflation coupled with negative savings and monstrous debt burdens can lead to prolonged periods of zero or negative growth as we had witnessed in Europe during the financial crisis about 10 years ago. Moreover, in the zealous crusade that waged globally against fiscal and monetary expansions, the merits and benefits of inflation have often been overlooked. Yes, I'm not drunk. You've heard me correctly. The merits and benefits of inflation. As economists are wont to point out time and again, inflation is not the inevitable outcome of growth. You can have growth without inflation. Inflation merely reflects the output gap between actual and potential gross domestic product, GDP. As long as the gap is negative, inflation lies dormant. If the economy is drowning in spare capacity, there is no inflation. The gap widens if economic growth is anemic and below the economy's potential. And so growth can actually be accompanied by deflation or with deflation. Indeed, it is arguable whether inflation had been subdued in America as elsewhere by the far-sighted policies of central bankers. I mean, central bankers would like to believe this, but is it the truth? Did central banks have anything to do with the flow and ebb with the waxing and waning of inflation? That's far from ascertained. A better explanation might be overcapacity, domestic overcapacity, global overcapacity, overcapacity wrought by decades of inflation, which had distorted investment decisions and decisions regarding allocation of resources, scarce resources. Excess capacity, coupled with increasing competition, globalization, privatization, and deregulation, all these forces led to ferocious price wars and to consistently declining prices, which is another way of saying deflation, the opposite of inflation. Central banks may have, had, may have had nothing to do with this, actually. Quoted by the economists at the time, Dresner Kleinwort Wasserstein noted that America's industry is already in the throes of deflation. That was about 20 years ago. The implicit price deflator of the non-financial business sector has been minus 0.6% 
in the year to the end of the second quarter of 2002. Germany faced this same predicament at the time. As oil prices surged, their inflationary shock gave way to a deflationary and recessionary aftershock. So depending on one's point of view, this is a self-reinforcing, virtuous or vicious cycle. Consumers learn to expect lower prices, inflationary expectations fall, and with these expectations, inflation itself declines. The intervention of central banks only hastens the process, and it threatens to render benign structural disinflation malignantly deflationary. We could even say that central banks are the agents which transform inflation to deflation by over-intervention, excessive intervention. They can't really fine-tune the economy that well, as we are evincing today with the explosion in unpredicted inflation. So should the United States reflate its way out of, an, of either an impending recession or defl deflationary anodyne growth? In the wake of the pandemic, everyone is expecting a contraction or was expecting a contraction or a recession. I was among the few who did not, by the way, on record, but many did. It is universally accepted that inflation leads to the misallocation of economic resources by distorting the price signal. Confronted with a general rise in prices, people get confused. Investors get confused. Managers and shareholders get confused. Everyone is confused. Inflation changes prices in unpredictable ways and contorts the contours of the market, of the free market. People are not sure whether to attribute the surging prices to a real spurt in demand, to speculation, to an underlying type of inflation, which we'll discuss a bit later, friction inflation, or what? People often make the wrong decisions consequently. They postpone investments, or they overinvest and embark on preemptive buying sprees. As Erika Groschen and Mark Schweitzer have demonstrated in an NBER working paper, paper titled Identifying Inflation's Grease and Sand Effects in the Labor Market, employers unable to predict tomorrow's wages hire fewer people. And still, the late preeminent economist James Tobin went as far as calling inflation the grease on the wheels of the economy. Now, that's a very far-fetched statement. What rate of inflation is desirable? The answer is, it depends on whom you ask. Like everything else in economics, this pseudoscience. The European Central Bank maintains an annual target of 2%, the Federal Bank, uh, the Federal Reserve, more or less the same. Other central banks, the Bank of England, for instance, they had used for a while an inflation band of between 1.5 and 2.5%. And again, the Fed has been known to tolerate inflation rates of anywhere up to 3 or 4%. These disparities among essentially similar economies, industrialized, advanced, these disparities reflect pervasive disagreements over what is being quantified by the rate of inflation and when and how inflation should be managed. The sin committed by most central banks is their lack of symmetry. Central banks signal visceral aversion to inflation, but they ignore the risk of deflation altogether. As inflation subsides, disinflation seamlessly fades into deflation. People accustomed to the deflationary bias of central banks expect prices to continue to fall or to stabilize. Therefore, they defer consumption, and this leads to inextricable and all-pervasive recessions. Yes, central banks create recessions. Inflation rates as measured by price ind indices, index, indexes, inflation rates fail to capture important economic realities. As the Boskin Commission revealed in 1996, some products are transformed by innovative technology even as their prices decline or remain stable. You're getting more for less or for the same. 
such upheavals are not encapsulated by the rigid categories of the questionnaires used by bureaus of statistics the world over to compile price data. You're getting more bang for your buck as technology improves the products. Cellular phones, for instance, smartphones, they were not a part of the consumption basket underlying the CPI in America as late as 1998, believe it or not. The consumer price index in the United States may be overstated by one percentage point year in and year out, was the startling conclusion of the Boskin Commission's report. Current inflation measures neglect to take into account all classes of prices, for instance, tradable securities. Wages, the price of labor, are left out. Yeah, you heard me right. The main price in the market, salaries, wages, is not a part of the calculation of inflation. The price of money, interest rates, is also excluded. Even if these were to be included, the way inflation is defined and measured today, they would have been grossly misrepresented. Consider a deflationary environment in which stagnant wages and zero interest rates can still have a negative or positive inflationary effect. In real terms, in deflation, both wages and interest rates increase relentlessly, even if they stay put. It's like Alice in Wonderland. You have to run very hard to stay in place. Yet it is hard to incorporate this downward stickiness into present-day inflation measures. The methodology of computing inflation obscures many of the quantum effects in the borderline between inflation and deflation. And so, as pointed out by George Akerlof, William Dickens, and George Perry in the Macroeconomics of Low Inflation, Brookings Papers on Economic Activity, 1996, as these authors have pointed out, inflation allows employers to cut real wages. Workers may agree to a 2% pay rise in an economy with a 3% inflation. They are unlikely to, expect, to accept a pay cut even when inflation is zero or less. And this is called the money illusion. Admittedly, it is less pronounced when compensation is linked to performance. And so according to The Economist, Japanese wages, with a backdrop of rampant deflation until recently, Japanese wages had shrunk by something like 5.6% uh, in the early 2000s, as company bonuses were brutally slashed. There are many forms of inflation. Consider, for example, friction inflation. Economists in the November 2000 conference, organized by the ECB, had argued that a continent-wide inflation rate of 0 to 2% would increase structural unemployment in Europe's arthritic labor markets by a staggering 2 to 4 percentage points. Ekelhoff Dickens Perry concurred in the aforementioned paper. At zero inflation, unemployment in America would go up in the long run by 2.6 percentage points. This adverse effect can, of course, be offset by productivity gains, as has been the case in the United States throughout the 1990s. The new consensus is that the price for a substantial decrease in unemployment need not be a sizable rise in, in inflation. The level of unemployment at which inflation does not accelerate is susceptible to government policies. It's called NIRU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. And governments determine this. Vanishingly low inflation, bordering on deflation, also results in a liquidity trap. The nominal interest rate cannot go below zero, of course. But what matters are real inflation-adjusted interest rates, as reflected, for example, in the bond market. If inflation is not zero or less, the authorities are unable to stimulate the economy by cutting interest rates below the level of inflation because it's zero. Again, in the bond market, bonds can yield negative interest. And this happens and is happening right now with many industrialized economies. But this is the bond market. This is not the central bank's transmission mechanism. It's not a direct intervention in the market, which is done by cutting interest rates. 
This has been the case, this liquidity trap, inability to cut interest rates below zero inflation rate. This has been the case in Japan in, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And it's been the case even in the United States at that time, in the early 2000s. The Federal Reserve, having cut interest rates 11 times during that period, and unwilling, was not willing to expand the money supply aggressively, actually reached at some point the end of its monetary tether. The Bank of Japan had resorted to unvarnished and assertive monetary expansion in line with what Paul Krugman called at the time, credible promise to be irresponsible. All these expansions in money supply and, and, and so on led to the sharp devaluation of certain currencies like the yen at the time. Inflation is exported through the domestic currency's depreciation and the lower prices of exports goods and services. Quantitative easing has this effect on some currencies. Inflation indirectly enhances exports and it helps to close yawning gaps in the current account. The United States, with its unsustainable trade deficits and resurgent budget deficits, could use some of this medicine, actually. But the upshots of inflation are fiscal, not merely monetary. In countries devoid of inflation, accounting, nominal gains are fully taxed. So where, where there are countries, there are some countries in, its, in which the accounting system doesn't take, is not inflation adjusted. And then nominal gains are fully taxed, though they reflect the rise in the general price level rather than any growth in income. Even when inflation accounting is introduced, inflationary profits are taxed. And so inflation increases the state's revenues. It's good for business as far as taxation. It's a form of tax. Inflation is a tax. It erodes the real value of the government's debts, obligations and expenditures denominated in local currency. Inflation acts as a tax and is fiscally corrective, but without the recessionary and deflationary effects of a real tax. So it's benign in effect. The outcomes of inflation, ironically, resemble the economic recipe of the Washington Consensus propagated by the likes, by the likes of the rapidly anti-inflationary IMF. As a long-term policy, inflation is unsustainable. It would lead to cataclysmic effects, of course. But in the short run, as a shock absorber, an automatic stabilizer, low inflation may be a valuable counter-cyclical instrument by siphoning off money in the form of indirect hidden tax. Inflation also improves the lot of corporate and individual borrowers by increasing their earnings and marginally eroding the value of their debts and savings. So is another counter-cyclical effect, actually injecting money into the economy in the sense that debts, obligations are eroded, but at the same time, so are savings. Inflation constitutes a disincentive, disincentive to save and an incentive to borrow, to consume and to speculate. The Economist calls it a splendid way to transfer wealth from savers to borrowers. So let's summarize these effects. Inflation in the long run is bad, but in the short run it's a shock absorber and automatic stabilizer. It's counter-cyclical. It's counter-cyclical because it's a form of taxation, reduces the government's or the state's obligations and, and so on and so forth and expenditures in local currency. And on the other hand, improves, allows people to borrow money. As earnings increase, the values of debts and obligations are eroded by inflation. So it's kind of monetary easing indirectly. It allows businesses and individuals to borrow more. Of course, there is a cost and the cost is a reduction in savings. So exactly as the economist said, it's a transfer of money from savers to borrowers. The connection between inflation and asset bubbles, on the other hand, is unclear. On the one hand, some of the greatest fees bubbles in history occurred during periods of disinflation 
One is reminded of the global boom in technology shares and real estate in the 1990s, for example, when there was no inflation. On the other hand, soaring inflation forces people to resort to hedges, insurance, such as gold, and realty, real estate. And this inflates the prices of assets in the process. Inflation, coupled with low or negative interest rates, also tends to exacerbate perilous imbalances by encouraging excess borrowing, as we said. And still, the absolute level of inflation may be less important than its volatility. Inflation targeting the latest fad among central bankers aims to curb inflationary expectations by implementing a consistent and credible anti-inflationary as well as anti-deflationary policies administered by trusted, a, a trusted and impartial institution. Yes, you guessed it correctly, the central bank. But we are miscalculating inflation. The most accurate yardstick of inflation is the GDP deflator, gross domestic um, product deflator, which includes the prices of capital goods and export and import prices. Regrettably, the GDP deflator is rarely used or mentioned in public. Instead, there's the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. But the Consumer Price Index is not the same as the Living Expenditures Index. Ever heard of it? No. The Living Expenditures Index measures the changes in the prices of the same products in, a, in any given period of time. The Consumer Price Index measures the changes in the prices of products bought through any given period of time, even if they are not the same products. In other words, even with changed consumption habits or changed specifications. The Consumer Price Index reflects the purchasing habits of the households which had participated in the surveys. This means that the measured level of inflation can be manipulated easily for political reasons and often is. For example, by changing the composition of the consumption basket, deciding the prices of which products and services will be included and which will be excluded or omitted. For example, by altering the weights, weight coefficients of the various products and services within the consumption basket. There is no agreed methodology on how to properly measure the service component in the economy, including government and public goods, rents, and barter or counter trade trans transactions. Choosing the right methodology can have a negative or positive effect on the level of measured inflation. Including or excluding certain retail and shopping venues, such as e-commerce, catalog sales, open-air markets, garage sales, and so on, also has an effect on inflation. Constructing a non-representative sample of households for the survey by overemphasizing certain locations, urban locations, west, versus East, North versus South, etc., etc., certain socioeconomic classes, like the middle class, or certain demographies, for example, minimizing the roles of seniors, teenagers, minorities. These are all manipulative tactics to affect the measurement of the consumer price index. You can exaggerate or minimize the role of the informal gray or black economy as well. So our measurement of inflation through the CPI is highly suspect and constantly manipulated. This is not theory, what I've just said. Governments manipulate the CPI, including the American government, all the time. What about measures to contain inflation and the trade deficit? Countries around the world, from Vietnam to Kazakhstan, have adopted several measures to reduce their bargaining inflation and trade deficits. For example, hedging fixing the future prices of foodstuffs, oil, and commodities by purchasing forward contracts and options in the global markets. Removal of import duties, excise taxes, VAT, value-added taxes, and other direct taxes and fees on all energy products and foodstuffs. Subsidizing the consumption of the poorest uh, segments of the population. Introducing price controls and freezing the prices of essential products. Banning the export of foodstuffs or introducing customs duties and quotas on such exports, raising interest rates and reserve requirements in the banking, banking system to prevent new credit formation, forcing banks to purchase government bonds to reduce liquidity in the market, administratively capping credit growth, and tightening lending to consumers and for real estate transactions.
freezing, reducing or waiving public sector fees and charges, releasing commodities, oil and minerals from strategic reserves, capping interest rates on deposits to prevent credit formation using money from new deposits, reclaiming agricultural lands and modernizing farms and agriculture long-term measures, declaring World Trade Organization, WTO, emergencies and introducing import quotas and duties on non-essentials and luxury goods, introducing an inflation target, allowing for a gradual devaluation of the currency within a band or range or as a crawling peg. A strong currency has anti-inflationary effects, so any devaluation must be minimal, slow and subject to market forces. This is a list, by no means exhaustive list, of all the measures currently implemented throughout the world to somehow try to tinker with inflation or control it. But what about deflation? Isn't deflation the real risk? Because it undermines the value of cash. Traditional economics claims that deflation actually increases the value of cash to its holder by enhancing the purchasing power of cash in an environment of declining prices, negative growth in the average price level. And so this is highly intuitive. Prices go down, the value of your cash goes up. Intuitive, but wrong. It is true that in a deflationary cycle, consumers are likely to delay consumption in order to enjoy lower prices later. But this precisely is what makes most asset classes, including cash, precarious and unprofitable. Cash is an asset. Deflationary expectations, let alone actual deflation, lead to liquidity traps and zero interest rates. This means that, or even negative interest rates. This means that cash balances, fixed term deposits in banks, yield no interest and bonds yield negative interest. But even zero interest translates into a positive yield in conditions of deflation, you could say. Theoretically, this fact should be enough to drive most people to hold cash. Yet, what economists tend to overlook is transaction costs. Banks charge you account fees that far outweigh the benefits of possessing cash even when prices are decreasing. Only in extreme deflation is cash with zero interest a profitable proposition when we take transaction costs, banking fees and charges into account. Extreme deflation usually results in the collapse of the banking system as deleveraging and defaults set in. Cash balances and deposits evaporate together with the financial institutes that are their custodians or that offer them. Deflation is bad because it destroys the economy. Deflation results in gross imbalances in the economy, delayed consumption and capital investment and an increase in debt burden in real deflation adjusted terms. These adversely affect manufacturing, services and employment. Government finances worsen as unemployment rises, business bankruptcies soar, and tax intake declines. Sovereign debt, another form of highly liquid safe investment, is rendered more default prone in times of deflation. And like inflation, deflation is a breakdown in the consensus over prices and in the price signal. As these signals are embodied in the currency, reified in the currency and in other forms of debt, a prudent investor would stay away from both currency and debt during periods of economic uncertainty. At the end, and contrary to the dicta of current economic orthodoxy, both deflation and inflation erode purchasing power. So all asset classes suffer equity, bonds, metals, currencies, even real estate. The sole exception is agricultural land. Food is the preferred means of exchange in barter economies. Ask Russia, ask Russians who had survived the 1990s. Food. This is, this is the currency when people face the tragic outcomes of the breakdown in the invisible hand of the market. What about income inequality and deflation? The more money we make, the less we appreciate the relative, respective and proportional value of this money to others. With very few exceptions, rich people, no matter how stingy, 
seem to lose touch with the pecuniary reality of the 99% of the population who are poor rare. Indeed, to the wealthy, money is monopoly money. It's not a store of value as much as a token which allows them to, to participate in economic and non-economic gains. I call this process of desensitization to the value of money personal inflation, because precisely like classic macroeconomic inflation, monetary inflation, as far as these affluent persons are concerned, as far as these rich people are concerned, the personal inflation thwarts and undermines the price signal. It distorts the efficient allocation of economic resources. It also misinforms their decisions, adversely affects their motivation to work, save and invest. Personal inflation demonetizes the economy. Demonetizes the economy. Rich people have an inflationary mindset. They prefer to spend their capital, but owing to the huge amounts involved, they are forced to hold on to the bulk of their money. They tie it down in assets, both tangible and financial. They want to consume and create an inflationary effect, but they end up saving and creating a deflationary outcome, demonetizing outcome. This money of rich people is taken out of circulation. It has zero velocity. Poorer people have a deflationary state of mind. They would like to hold on to their money, but they are forced to spend most of it or even all of it, not to mention to avail themselves of additional credits and loans. Poor people wish to save and have a deflationary effect, but they end up consuming and having an inflationary outcome. And so all economic players in the marketplace end up acting irrationally against their preferences, against their innermost as well as expressed wishes and, and, and priorities. And this gulf between the desires and actions of all the economic agents is the main source of instability and uncertainty in the capitalist system, based as it is on wealth transfer from the many to the few and its accumulation in the hands of the few. What are the effects of these discrepancies in the perception of money between the rich and the rest of us? How is this psychological gap, abyss, manifested in economic expectations and in one's grasp of one's purchasing power based on streams of future income. How does the price signal react to income inequality? The larger the disparities between rich and poor, the greater the share of national wealth held by the rich, the more deflationary the economy. Rich people consume only a tiny portion of their wealth. The rest is tucked away in the vaults of financial institutions, in real estate, in art, in inert bonds. The money of rich people is effectively taken out of circulation. Its velocity drops precipitously. Admittedly, rich people's savings do serve as a source for investments, but only when the transmission mechanisms of the financial system are intact and when trust is reasonably high. In times of crisis and recession, financial institutions tend to be rendered dysfunctional and trust abates or disappears altogether. Redistribution via schemes of progressive taxation does ameliorate some of the deflationary effects of income inequality, but can, but can never counter income inequality wholly and effectively and altogether. Thank you for listening.